Welcome, everyone, to the 100th show of So Very Wrong About Games. Insert fanfare here. At some point, we should probably just give it a rest. I Really? I know. Put it to bed, right? Leave I'm, well enough alone. Enough already. We've heard enough from you. Go back to sleep. Stop pushing our luck. Exactly. That being said, I'd really like to thank all of the listeners. I'd like to thank you as well, Mark, for bearing with me through all these shows. Oh, thanks, Walker. Thanks to you, too. And uh, thanks for everyone for listening. I want to thank publishers and designers and for providing these great games for us to play with. And also, this being a fifth show, i.e. a multiple of five, Mark, we have to talk about our Patreon. I was going to save this for the news. We'll save we do, for, we'll we do save. have a little bit of Patreon news. Tiny bit. Oh, then we'll just we'll just push on through. So this is the one other show. Also, we're going to be doing our top 10 and stuff for 2019. The 2019 extra, extravaganza show, Mark. Yes. Insert second fanfare here. Thank you for wearing pants. Yes. I, for one, am wearing one of my cleaner pairs of underwear with, with fewest numbers of holes. I mean, I couldn't be bothered with the pants, though. I figured I'd leave that for you. So we haven't really said, my name's Mike Walker. I'm here with my great friend, Mark Bigney. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? This is going to be a show, like every other show, I'm sure. We're going to talk about... <laughs> we're going what? To talk... what? As, in, as in, we're going to talk about the games we played this week. Oh, sure. We're going to talk about board game news and why it doesn't matter. And then we're our topic, which is going to be the retrospective look back to 2019 extravaganza. Mark, what did you play this week? I get to play Blood Rage. It was great. Really? Yes. I love Blood Rage. It's marvelous. We both love Blood Rage. Yeah. We both heavily, to our maximum extent, tricked out our copies of Blood Rage because we both love it. In what way have you tricked out your copy? Well, remember, we I bought the... the oh, that's true. The, the, the store. The Game Night, promo, the game night kit promo kit that has some of, but not nearly all of, the Kickstarter exclusives. That's true. Yeah, you get Yes, I'm hard, sorry. You... My, my copy is the one true, perfect, oh, and complete copy, and so Lord. I get confused. Here's the thing. <laughs> we got the, the standard rubberneckers. You know, we were playing a four-player game of Blood Rage, and a whole bunch of people were like, oh, you're playing Blood Rage. I would have joined you if I'd known. So, you know, <laughs> very well-loved game in our local community. And it got the standard amount of negging from people who don't have the Kickstarter exclusives, complaining that the Kickstarter exclusives are unbalanced and don't work. I, I, I stress that this is all from people who don't have these things, and so I have to assume it is some amount of sour grapes. But I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You can either do the end of the world with Fenrir, or you can do it wrong. So, sure enough, <laughs> that's the way to do it. <laughs> Like, who's going to swallow the moon if Fenrir isn't there? Exactly. Who's Are you going to do it? No. I don't think so. It's too big, Mark. So it's quit your complaining. Yeah. That's Anyhow, uh, Blood Rage, great time was had by all. I was reminded again at how smooth the rules explanation is. We had some people who hadn't played for a few years, and, and they effectively wanted a full rules explanation. I'm like, oh, okay, well, you draft cards, and then you, they do what they say they do, more or less. I mean, it's not quite that simple, but it, it's almost that simple. And every time I play, I am reminded again at how subtle the timing is. Because you have a mitt full of cards at the start of every age, and you figure, well, I want to play them all, I can afford to play them all. And then about halfway through the age, you start to realize, wait a minute, the round might end. And if it ends before I put out this thing that I thought I had all the time in the world to play, I'm going to be completely behind the eight ball, and it's going to cost me a grotesque quantity of points. And it's that element that I really like. Every time it's your turn, you may have looked at your hand of cards and say, I'll just I'll play these all. But every time you play a card, you're giving up tempo. And you're leaving open the possibility that someone's going to sneak into that village spot you need, or that someone's going to pillage that place that you wanted to get into, or the round's going to end out from under you. It's a great game, but in that extent, I'm repeating myself. Blood yeah, rage. I'm just saying the components are great. Even your, like, your little board tracks your rage, and it has the turn structure and all the different actions you can do. Nice and simplistic, and a great teaching tool as well. I think you mean simple. Simplistic is, is generally a pejorative. I agree. I got to play It's a Wonderful World, Mark. This is a game that we both are increasingly enjoying. I the, the second game, which was the first game this week, I was a little concerned about luck of the draw, but you really just have to learn how to roll with your punches. And if you're not getting the cards that you want, then guess what? The cards that you're getting are the ones that you're going to have to use. Because <laughs> this is a game that just doesn't last that long, and you're just going to have to get an engine of some kind, because the engine's there. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. You just have to figure out which one you're going to go with. Because if if your teammates are taking certain cards, then they're there for you to take. One thing that became has become increasingly clear to me with respect to luck in the draw in particular 
is it is exacerbated when you're playing with the intro sides. So first of all, it's worth noting that like many games, it's a wonderful world. You can start with an intro side or the, you know, more experienced player side. And unlike every other game in existence, certainly in the Eurosphere, the intro side is the more asymmetric, more complicated one. And it's more complicated because it, that, that makes it easier for the player. It gives you a starting bonus. You get more points for this color of card, or you get more points for generals, or more points for financiers. And so it gives you something to shoot for, and it gives you a built-in sort of path to follow. Whereas the advanced side, everyone starts out with the same level of production. And as a result, it gets far more cutthroat and far more vicious and far more difficult to score points because there's nothing handed to you. Well, that's the other thing it does too, right? Because everyone has a certain way to go. It sort of divides the cards up. So you're not all fighting for the same cards and it sort of like, you know, separates the game so everyone gets an equal experience. Just so. And so the advanced version really reduces that luck of the draw element because you're not starting the game looking for green cards. In one game I played recently, I had the the one where you get point bonuses for green cards, and there weren't zero green cards in the first draft. None whatsoever. Which is not crippling. This is not a serious complaint about the overall balance of the game, because as you say, it's relatively short, and the goal of any drafting game is to make do with the dog's breakfast that's dealt to you. But in the context of It's a Wonderful World, when you can play with the quote-unquote advanced side, it's far more challenging. And I say this in the context of a repeated comment that I make whenever playing It's a Wonderful World. It's been a long time since a Euro game has made me feel this stupid. And I mean that as a compliment. Because I think I can figure out how to manage the production. And it's a very straightforward game. It's not, this is not a Vital Lacerda with systems upon systems. It's just a question of, oh, okay, well, I'm going to be producing this many gray cubes, so I should really figure out what to do with those gray cubes. And I would like to be able to produce yellow cubes. It could be something as simple as that. And I will fail miserably, and I'll end up with no way to use the gray cubes and no way to produce the yellow. And I look down, and I figure, I thought I had a plan. Where did it go? And so it's a testament, I think, to the quality of the decision-making involved. It's a really solid drafting game. And my, my sincere recommendation is, as soon as you think you are ready, move to the advanced sides. Take the plunge. It feels like a tighter, more demanding experience, and therefore has my recommendation. And the other thing is, if the cards don't go your way, the game doesn't overstay its welcome. You know. Absolutely. Just reset, play another game, because it's super quick, super fast, super fun. And that is It's a Wonderful World. It's by put out by Lucky Duck Games and two other producers, and it's by Frederick Garrard. Played a couple of games of Battle for Baternia. Battle for Baternia is a review copy sent to us by the publisher Stone Circle Games. This was in response to my repeated comments that up until playing Cloudspire, I had not yet played a MOBA-style game that I disliked. Battle for Returning is a two-player MOBA-style game, replete with towers to knock down and a base to, to, to bust open, and a whole bunch of heroes with asymmetric powers. And it seemed like to me, upon initial blush, that it was kind of like Guards of Atlantis, but for two players. And that's actually high praise, because we're big fans of Guards of Atlantis, and it gets a lot of things right. It's, it's similar to Guards of Atlantis in that you play out a face-down card to each of the heroes, and they'll trigger in a certain way. And it's mostly about hero interaction, and in, in, in the context of Battle for Baternia, the minions are entirely gone. There's no effective representation of minions, other than the, in the most abstract sense that you can spend an action to gain a gold by quote-unquote farming. But it really, the minions aren't present on the map in any serious way. And I will say this, Battle of Returnia is very, very, very good at introducing new information at a relatively good pace. Your heroes level up relatively speedily, and that gives them access to more and more powers and more and more combos and more and more ability to exert their special asymmetry. And so the on-ramping there is very, very good. And it is a joy, genuinely, to draft different heroes. And there's a ton available in the base box. Each of them only has four different cards available to them. You get one new one every time you level up. But even within that, you get a fair amount of variety and a fair amount of comboing. But I will say this, I miss the minions. I seriously do. One of my favorite elements of the MOBA genre isn't so much asymmetric heroes going at it, because that's been done a number of times in a number of different games in a number of different contexts. What I like is the interaction between heroes and the geographic element of minions going around and balancing PvP and balancing PvE, which is the minion combat, and exploiting minions and so yeah, forth. Yeah, manipulating them in a, in a cool way, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And the two MOBA games that I like most, namely Rum and Bone 2nd Edition and Guards of Atlantis, it's a lot about that balance and that tactical trade-off, very much like the elements that I enjoyed in MOBA games when I played for the five hot seconds when I played. 
The other problem that this introduces in the context of Battle for, Battle for Baternia, past just personal preference, is once a tower is knocked down in Battle for Baternia, you don't really have a way to stop your opposing heroes from moving around. In both games that I played, once a tower goes out, your base is just wide open. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'm not saying that the game is necessarily over, but the interesting tactical movement kind of sort of takes a backseat because it's just in your interest to rush the opposing base and have at it because... Unlike other MOBA-style games, number one, there's no minions to get in the way. You can't plug that hole with anything else. And heroes don't obstruct movement in Battle for Baternia. And, and finally, heroes are relatively beefy. Unlike in, say, Guards of Atlantis, where a single well-placed hit, especially in the context of minions, will take out a hero, so you can't be too, too foolhardy. And in the context of Roman Bone's Second Tide, where, again, because of the meat shields of the minions and because you can gang up at heroes, there's a lot of other things that can go on and you're not, you're, you're a little more fragile. So, given that con, I don't know if this is a new player problem or if experience will get rid of this, but in the context of the MOBA style, it really is a question of what are you abstracting away? What are you implementing? We talked about this in the context of our Cloudspire review. We talked about this in the context of other MOBA games. What elements are you going to focus on? What elements are you going to ignore? What elements are you going to represent abstractly? And Battle for Baternia isn't quite calibrated to what it is that, that I want out of a MOBA experience because of this trade-off with minions and such. If I just want to play uh, an arena-style combat game where it's mostly about asymmetric heroes with a sense of geographic positioning, I already have Aristea. And playing Battle for Baternia has really made me appreciate the way in which Aristea is kind of sort of a MOBA game, even though it doesn't deal with a lot of conventions because positioning is all important and all crucial. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I've just been talking about the ways in which it suffers in comparison. This is only in comparison. Battle for Returning It was a very quick 45-minute experience, which is not something that could be said of the other MOBA-style games, and that's definitely in its favor. And it's got adorable 8-bit pixel art. It's got a wonderful sense of hero combination. As I said, you get a tremendous sense of variety right out of the base box. And so in comparing it with some of my all-time favorites of the past few years in the tactical combat genre, it comes up a little bit short. Uh, but I'm eager to see the rest of the heroes. I'm eager to see the rest of the combinations. And I do think a lot of the quality of MOBA games does shine through in the context of Battle for Baternia. So I've enjoyed it, but I don't think it's quite up to the comparisons of a lot of the other ones that I've really adored. And so those are my early impressions of Battle for Baternia. Finally got to play Istanbul. People have been telling me I should try Istanbul for years. Uh, among them, the reason is that it was designed by Rudyard Dorn, one of my favorite game designers of about 15 years ago. And Istanbul is probably his most successful game of the past little while. He's designed games like Goa and like Traders of Genoa, now simply Genoa, because everything needs to drop. Determining yes, all the silly now, extra words. That help you understand what the exactly. game is about. He designs lighter games now, things like Las Vegas and Istanbul. And, but Istanbul similarly has some of his characteristic elements. There's something about picking up and dropping off pieces that Rudiger Dorn loves, not even just to pick up a deliver context. He just loves things being dropped off. Did it in Louis XIV as well. And so it's got a little bit of that. It's just, it's a straight race to get a certain number of points in a relatively Euro style. You buy goods, you sell goods, you activate some stuff, you roll some dice, some things happen. It was fine. I mean, it was, it was a pleasant experience. It lasted about an hour. If it lasted any longer than that, and I could definitely see that happening with analysis paralysis prone, prone players, because it's very much a question of, okay, I go here, so then I can go to this other place, then I can go to this other place. The movement reminded me a little bit of Yokohama. Yokohama having come out after, but nonetheless, they, they seem very similar, in that you had to have a sense of where you were going and when you were going to activate various tiles that you were going to. I prefer Yokohama in that sense. There was a little bit more meat to the bone. I, I seriously got the impression that Given the relatively small number of points you're trying to get to, five points in a four-player game, and the relative paucity of things to do, I didn't really feel like there's a whole lot of space to explore. And as a result, the length, in this case, worked to its disadvantage. It was more just a question of, oh, well, I'm just going to hit a bunch of tiles a bunch of times, and there we go. Uh, this makes it sound like I'm, I'm ragging on it. It was fine. It was, it was a perfectly pleasant intro-style Euro game. And I'd probably prefer it to a lot of the other lighter stuff that's come out in the past couple a couple of years. Rudiger Dorn is a very, very talented guy, and this has a little bit of his trademark. But at the end of the day, there was nothing really there to spark uh, a strong reaction from me. And that was my experience with Istanbul. Made me want to play Goa again. 
which yeah, is I my favorite want, Rudiger Dorn. Yeah, I want to play it again. I like in Istanbul. I like the you know deciding when to pull back all your pieces type thing. I love you know the, you know decide that trade off right. Which reminded me, I want to do a little pullback from the trade. Speak when I said trade off, it responded. When we're talking, we we're talking about Marvel, the card game, Marvel Champions, Marvel Champions. <laughs> I mean, I was, what I just want to say is that we're, we're a little harsh on it, but there is what's much, this we business. I was a little harsh on yes, it. Yes, you were. It has the same same thing. It's the same sort of thing when you're playing. I just want to make a point that there is a little bit to it where you're playing the cards. You have to decide which ones you're going to use for resources and which ones you're going to use to play. So there is a bit of decision space there, much like Maracaibo, where you have a hand of cards and you have to decide which ones you're going to play and which ones you're going to use for resources. So there's a little bit more there, even though it's still a terrible game. <laughs> what else did you play, Mark? Finally, got to try Codenames The Simpsons. Code names The Simpsons. I saw a very good tweet the other day on Board Game Twitter talking about how the next edition of Code Names is going to be Code Names, Code Names edition, where every card was just a version of Code Names that had been published. That would be amazing. That would be a great version of Code Names. Here's what I'm going to say about so Code So is it pictures or is it words from Simpsons or is it? The answer to that is yes. Yes. This yes is, to both. This is why I wanted to mention it because this was suggested by someone of our acquaintance who is both a big fan of Code Names and a big fan of The Simpsons. I am one of those two things. I'm a big fan of code names. I think I last saw The Simpsons when I was 18, I guess, which is 52 years ago. Yes. And ultimately, uh, I was I was nervous primarily because not only did I feel like I wasn't really going to be able to engage with the game in a substantive level due to my ignorance, also this person in question is extremely competitive, and so I was very worried about what was going to happen in this context. However, here's what I'll say. I'm impressed, and I do genuinely don't know if this is true of the other licensed versions, that every card is two-sided, and on one side is a picture, and on the other side is a word or a small number of words related to what that picture is. So, for example, on one side, there was a picture of Lisa dressed up as the Statue of Liberty. I assume this is a reference to something that happened in the show. And on the other side was the word Liberty. So... That doubles your options. If you like Codenames Pictures because you don't have good taste, you can play Codenames Pictures with with this version. If you prefer Codenames as it was intended, you know, the fun one, you can play it with words there. We played it both versions, and I don't really feel, except for a couple of instances where the characters were uh, had names that I didn't remember. There was uh, one of the guys at the bar. I don't remember what. Oh, uh, Lenny. I looked at the card. Well, you have a handy cheat sheet on the back of the card. You can look it up. Uh, one of the characters named Lenny, and I didn't remember who he was, but you get to play code names either way you want to. So if you're really, really into a certain theme, or if you figure you want to get sucker people in on the license version, this is at least a clever use of the license. And it uses the components with a slightly more flexibility than you might imagine. And I just wanted to call attention to the fact that in this particular licensed version, you could play either Codenames Pictures or Codenames with Words. Yeah, I'm wondering if, if the other version is the same, whether you can just shuffle them all together and you can play some sort of weird mix of, <laughs> of like, <laughs> like, like, like almost like you said, but sure. just like some, because it would it work just as same as anything. And those are the games we played this week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. And the news is kind of rough this week, Mark. Because this is the very beginning of the year, and like we're doing our our look back to 2019, a lot of publishers don't want to put out games right at the beginning of the year, because often they're forgotten when they're put out so early, and they usually put them back, you know, push them back towards the end, so they get to show up in these fantastic shows like this. But I found some stuff. What do you got? Just wanted to give a minor update to Comet 2.0, Blood in the Sand. Your complaints about how there was not going to be a nicely printed professional rulebook. It turns out they are going to print new versions of the rulebook for Comet 1.5 and of the player aids. There's not going to be an omnibus rulebook with all the expansion content in it, however. And they've also said, contrary to what I understood at the time, that there is going to be an upgrade kit for Blood and Sand Comet 2.0 for versions of the original version. Now, details are sketchy at this point about what it's going to consist in. It's not going to be able to, for example, match the new board because they plan on changing the board. But there is going to be an attempt to make sure that all users of Comet will be able to go up to 1.5 and or 2.0 if they want to. So good on Matigo for doing that. Also, they're going to be doing it on Kickstarter. This is going to be Matigo's first Kickstarter. Nice. I, I don't know about that. It'll mean that we uh, won't get it this year. We'll get it in about five years from now, thanks to Chinese New Year. But it might have all sorts of extra cool bits in it that will get sure. But there are already back the production. Yes, but there are already further. tons of cool. There was a guy riding a giant scorpion. Know, what else can't... do you need? I... So, Mark, there is 
a production company called Mixlore. They work with a bunch of licensed properties. They have a Top Gun strategy game. They have Black Mirror Nosedive. They are going to be putting out a game called The Shining. It'll be one of these deductive, one person's the traitor type game. Games are good. I hear that all work and no play it's, makes it's, Walker a dull boy. Well, I'm just saying, it's a, it's a licensed extravaganza. Not only is it being put out by people who do many licensed things, it's being developed by people who do a lot of license, uh, licensed things by, where do I, sorry, it's called the Prosper Hall Design Team. Oh, yeah. They've created Horrified, Disney Villainous, the Choose Your Own Adventure. So, from what I read, it looks very interesting. And like you said, we don't want to be dull boys. That would be bad. So, Cosmic Encounter, Walker. Yes, my favorite game of all time. I know you're not a fan of the game, but Cosmic Encounter is primarily a negotiation game. For a long time, people have tried to make a two-player version, and the general consensus is, even amongst the Cosmic Encounter diehards, that two-player Cosmic Encounter is a waste of time. Enter Fantasy Flight Games, who have decided to release a two-player version of Cosmic Encounter. This is going to be called Cosmic Encounter Duel. Its visuals appear to be inspired by disco dancing. It's kind of like somebody looked at Black Angel and said, you know what, the color palette there is too muted. We need a little bit more pink, we need a little bit more purple, we need a little bit more pizzazz, and maybe filter through a disc golf ball and and see what happens. It's going to be uh, Black Angel met met Jurassic Park. Totally liquid, man. Having having read a little bit about it, it seems like it's taking significant departures from the Cosmic Encounter formula, which is probably for the best, because Cosmic Encounter is not designed to be a two-player game. So we'll see what happens. I am not optimistic, but hey, if Fantasy Flight is going to do anything now that they've completely shuttered their digital and RPG divisions. Well, speaking of which, my my Fantasy Flight game news is, you know, the Keyforge card game. I'm familiar with it, Well, did you want to go more in-depth into that world, Mark? There is now an RPG for Keyforge. Yes, there'll be a whole book and everything. Evan. But they just closed their RPG division. No. Well, well, because they finally finished their... Their, their magnum their, opus? Their magnum opus. Oh, okay. Of which Having is, reached the apotheosis of their... Oh, which geez. is the Key Forge role-playing game. Okay. Yeah, that's a thing that they did. That's insult to injury. It's like, ugh. Not only do you get to lose your job, your last credit gets to be the Key Forge role-playing game. That's that's just... Now I'm sad. You've made me sad. I'm, I'm sad. I'm very sorry. There's also a game called Traintopia. It's being put out by the... The board and dice, the the designers, the group that I like very much. It's another train game, but it seems very interesting. You're drafting certain train tiles, whether it be tourist or commuter or mailbag, and you sort of add them to your track network, and you're going to be scoring points based on, you know, all your different networks. So it sounds like it's going to be interesting just because the artwork looks amazing. It's very visually appealing. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Just last week, I commented that the joke used to be that every game is about auctioning trains, and now we've gotten to the point where we're literally drafting trains. Time is a flat circle. It's full circle, man. Yeah. So, uh, Pascal Bernard is a designer who put out Time of Legends Joan of Arc, which was published by Mythic Games. Mythic Games recently ran a 1.5 Kickstarter to update some of the rules, materials, and to offer people access to the game again. I have not yet played Time of Legends Joan of Arc. I've got a copy sitting in my basement, but maybe I'll get around to it. Maybe I won't. The reason why I bring this up in the context of news is Pascal Bernard claims he has not been paid. He says that other than in advance, he has not been paid any of the royalties, and he had nothing to do with the second Kickstarter that Mythic Games has put out, and he is now pursuing legal action. Mythic Games does not apparently, I say apparently here because the information is very much in flux, Mythic Games does not dispute that they have not paid him royalties. Whether they think they have to is unclear. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to flag attention to this ongoing mess because uh, train wrecks are fun to watch, I guess. Speaking of Kickstarter train wrecks, Mark... There is a game called Eclipse, and they brought out a second edition. Brought out is an interesting term. In what well, way did they bring it it's out? It's not quite brought out. It's not quite out yet. But this is the, my part. You can. Ex- you can. Ex- this is the how I'll, I'll tell the story, and you can tell me how I am wrong. Sure. So they've explained to everyone how it's going to be shipping out to most places around the world, except for Canada and Australia. Well, no, they, they've explained that fulfillment has begun. Has begun, except for Canada, who only has two. Up here in Canada, A, eh, they have but two postal dates, right? We get mail twice a year. <laughs> and I talked to my postal worker and he said, like, no way, A. Eh. Anyway, that being said, they said, to our Canadian backers, we have we have another project. Just so you know, we have another project coming out in March. So 
So in order for us to save money... Maybe it'll come out in March. Maybe it'll come out in March. Well, it's a Kickstarter, so March, April, May, June will probably be when it ships. We're just going to hold your Eclipse games at the harbor in in China until we're ready to ship this second project. And then to save us money, we're going to ship it all at once. Then you'll get your games. Look, we understand. Now, we understand that you paid, like everybody else, at the same time. I was going to say, the Canadian backers, and the the Australians, by the way, the Australians are in the same boat, literally. They really should have paid for international shipping at the time of the pledge. That might have expedited things. Oh, I I think they might have. Oh, really? They actually paid for shipping? They did. Oh, well, then it sounds like they're really in the shaft, doesn't it? It's so weird. And uh, this just seems to be a Kickstarter thing that's just hitting over and over. They're just, they're taking our money ahead of time, and... And there's funny business going on, Mark. Here's the thing. We want to stress, neither of us has a dog in this race. Neither of us pledged for this. That is correct. And we've come into the past that Canadian backers are routinely getting the shaft, but this is a new level of audacity. And one of the things that I, that I really, really, really want to draw attention on, as far as Colossal is concerned, is the way they've been abusing language. Look, language is ambiguous. We can have different interpretations of things. But there's an industry standard, the way that everyone else talks about fulfillment. When people say fulfillment has begun, what they mean is copies are being shipped to backers, as in locally. There is a package with your game on it, and the package has your name on it. The package has been delivered to a local carrier. That's fulfillment. As opposed to fulfillment has begun, by which they mean manufacture has been completed in China, and we think we have a port date, which is what they've been using. And they've done this before with other projects as well. And this is not a new use of the term. This is a colossalism. And when people call them on it, they're like, oh, well, you know, whatever. And they do this in part so they can claim that they have met deadlines, either the deadlines promised in the Kickstarter campaign or deadlines that they've revised deadlines that they have offered later. Look, let me be perfectly clear. This is not about delays intrinsically. So Eclipse Second Edition, if it now gets delivered according to their new revised promises, we delivered over a year late. But that isn't the end of the world as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to defend delays. People should have realistic expectations, and I don't buy a lot of the excuses for delays. But it's something we're used to, right? It's par for the course when it comes to Kickstarter. I just hate it when people are weaselly about it, and I hate it when the delays are as a result of a desire of the publisher to save a couple of dollars as far as shipping is concerned. Or when it's targeted. And when it's targeted, exactly. So the same thing that happened with respect to Reavers of Midgard, and, well, we could ship in two waves, but that sounds expensive. So even though it's our fault, we're going to make you wait while we solve our problem in the way that's cheapest for us. And that's exactly what's happening here with Colossal. We could fulfill at the same time, but quite frankly, you're too small a pond, and even though we charge you for international shipping at the time, we're going to make you wait, and we think that maybe in a couple months, and what's shocking me, actually, honestly, just as a sort of capper to this, is the way that it's being reported by backers and the way that it's being reported by media generally, it's as though Colossal's word has any weight to it at all. So they tell us now, we think we'll probably get a new port date in March. They've already made up dates and twisted language and played fast and loose with details half a dozen to a dozen times over the course of this campaign. Why on earth is everyone reporting this March date as though it's gospel? It's made up like everything else. Like So the long, the long, the short of it is American games are going to be on the water soonish, but again, that's according to Colossal's word and Canadian games and Australian games are going to be in the water. eh, Who knows? Who knows? That's the part that I object to strongly. It's not the delays in and of itself. Because the, the the big benefit of Kickstarter was supposed to be transparency. Yes. We were supposed to be part. It was supposed to be collaborative endeavor. You get to deal with creators and be part of the magical process. Not being given a new avenue for nonsense spin that wouldn't even pass marketing considerations for an entry level marketing skis ball, or or painful consumer relations. Absolutely. On better news, Mark, we both love Mechs versus Minions. We do. It's a league. League of Legends spin-off type game. They have hinted around that they're going to be coming out with yet another board game. <laughs> it's literally a 1 second flash in yeah. their in their in their 2020 video, but but the production value of Mechs versus Minions is so high. I know I sh- shouldn't say I know, but I just their their team is full of board gamers and they did such a great job on their very first production. I think this is going to be just as good if not better. Looking forward to seeing it. 
If Riot Games once again wants to waste tremendous quantities of money spoiling us with a lavishly produced game sold at prices that are not in le- in league with other board games, I am all in. All right, so Patreon news. As you know, here on So Very Wrong About Games, we have no sponsors, we have no ads. This is all part and parcel of why we started this podcast. We want to bring our opinions unabridged, unedited. So if you like what we do, we love our Patreon backers, so feel free to check out our new pledges that Mark's going to talk about right now. 2020 is going to be the year of the patron uh, patron reward. I've decided that since we love giving things away so much, and we haven't been giving enough appreciation to our lovely commissioners and overlords, we're just going to start sending them games. The... Pilot Project is working out extremely well. I've already got four games ready to send out to our commissioners and overlords. Some of them pretty rare and out of print, and we hope they enjoy them. And we just like giving stuff away. True, and I have some interviews coming up for this beginning of this new year. That should be very interesting as well. And that is all of the news and why it really does not matter. Now on to our topic, which is the 2019 Retrospective Extravaganza. How are we going to start this, Mark? Well, I'd like to start on a, on a seriously somber note. I would just like to once again mention that 2019 has been an awful year for losing very, very talented game designers. I feel it's kind of like the echo of that you know one year where we lost both David Bowie and Prince in rapid succession. We had to say goodbye to Chad Jensen, Richard Berg, and Francis Tresham, three wonderful, wonderful people who put out tremendous products that have brought me countless hours of entertainment and joy. And it's tragic that we lost them all in the same year. It would have been tragic to lose any one of them, but all three in the same year feels like a tremendous loss to the hobby. And that is the downer I wanted to start our retrospective on. I'm glad we you know, left it to the very end, so the rest will be up. So I think we should get started with our top 10 of 2019. You want to do the top longer? 10 first? Yeah, or let's do you? the okay. top Look, right. that's what we've done in the years past. We're, no we're, problem. We're right. tradition bound. So I'm going to put caveats on my top 10 like I always do. Okay, why don't you well, my top- share your deep... My top ten are misgivings in, about top my, ten lists. My top ten are in in no order, except for the number one, of course. And it's not as though these games are you know the best designed, the best mechanics, the best of anything. I picked ten games which I felt would be able to hold their own weight on your shelf. These are games that will be played if they are on your shelf. They won't collect dust. They'll stay there throughout the years. And I think that these from 2019, these are the 10 that I feel will do that. Uh, I chose based on the same criteria I always do, which of the games I'd rather play. I'll start because I'm because Men at Work is amazing. Men at Work <laughs> is a dexterity game. We hate dexterity games here. Yeah, they're just not fun. They are awful. Yeah. So Men at Work is this great game where you put out these three huge foundation blocks and you throw out a bunch of girders and you start drawing cards and the cards are going to tell you to add more girders or start placing these workers with bricks or planks on their shoulders and this this building or this, you know, skeletal uh, frame starts building up on your table and is very uh, balancy and tedious and is a joy to play because... Tedious? Uh, tippy. Tenuous, I think. Tenuous. Okay. Tenuous. So you put out a worker and he slides off the girder and then you get these, you know, great stories about how that was, that was Phil and this was Phil's last day on the job <laughs> and he was, he was about to retire and his son had come to him with work that day and... Oh no. <laughs> it was, it was... It was this the story. Hor- the story keeps getting more elaborate and it depressing. Was, it was horrific as as five girders fell fell on top of me. You blame just, me just, for being a downer. Just stories like this, and I just love uh, that's men at work. Try it out. Phil had a son, and kill kill as many workers as you can. I did put my list in order. At number ten, we've already talked about it. It's a wonderful world. That is my tenth favorite game in 2019. I've said a lot about it. It is the best drafting game I think I've played since Fairy Tale in terms of pure drafting. It's got wonderful sense of tension and it makes me feel dumb. So with a simple rule set and having such careful and considered a- approaches to economy building, I think it's a very very successful design. So number 10, it's a wonderful world. Couldn't agree more. It's on my list too. It's a wonderful world. It definitely gives me, like I even commented with you the other day, it gives me that feel of fairy tale with a just slight more complexity as into the order in which you're going to put your cards up because you collect resources in a certain order. So 
you, you can, you know, chain together these very interesting combos that, you know, I don't know what it is. It's just one of those things that are enjoyable to me. Next on my list is going to be Star Star Trek Conflict in the Neutral Zone. Just the name alone, <laughs> how can you not put it on someone's list? So in this, this is a Crokino type dexterity game. It's like Crokinole in the sense that you very much want to exercise zone control and you want your discs to be as close as possible to the middle and you want your opponent's discs to be knocked out. It's got a not a fantastic theme, but a semi-interesting theme where a lot of the ships have special abilities which aren't overpowering. Some of them are very clever and interesting and there's a, a way to collect income and buy these new ships and it doesn't overstay its welcome. And that's uh, Star Trek Conflicts in the Neutral Zone. My number nine is Rangers of Shadow Deep, the solo or co-op indie miniatures game with hints of role-playing elements. I've been talking about the Rangers of Shadow Deep campaign on and off all year, about the various scenarios we've tried and my experiences with it. I think it has just the right level of narrative. The rule set isn't going to bog you down. It's very, very simple. It's mostly designed to be able to get your, get your models on the table in varied in uh, different contexts. It requires... You have a rather extensive miniature collection, a lot of experience with setting up tables with varied terrain, but if you can get past those hurdles, it's a lot of fun. I've been having a lot of enjoyment with Rangers of Shadow Deep. The Deluxe Edition is going to be released soon in a lovely new hardback edition with some minor rules adjustments that have already been made independently accessible. My number nine of 2019 is Rangers of Shadow Deep. My next game is Black Angel. This is a game where a gigantic mothership is hurtling across space trying to find a habitable planet. And you make it shoot out these little scoring opportunity things where you have to fly your robots out and and keep pushing the engine to score victory points. It's also a dice worker placement game where you don't actually get to use your workers because people will selfishly steal them. But you can take actions to get more dice so you have more options and more robots and and has this grid where you're sliding tiles along to create this cool little engine buildy thing overall i thought it was one of the shining lights in this year and i really enjoyed playing it and that is black angel my number eight is res arcana the tom layman tableau builder which i can confidently predict will not be in walker's list of the best of 2019 it does so much with so little so much action out of a scant level uh, number of cards it's really quick and cutthroat plays well with practically any number of players, although it, I haven't tried it with five. I don't see why you would want to, to be quite frank. And the expansion really gave it a lot of interesting variety. It's not the most stunningly exciting game of the year. That's one of the reasons why it's it's kind of a sleeper. I know a number of other people who, in compiling their lists of the best of 2019, completely forgot about Res Arcana. And it's like, oh yeah, Res Arcana, that belongs on the list. Well, like, so that's an awkward position to be in. <laughs> but like we talked about the news, right? Usually, you know, they don't issue games so early in the year. And that's what happened with Res Arcana. It came out almost very first thing of the of 2019. And it was like slowly forgotten over the year it's true but i've been playing it again more recently and i've been having a great time with it my number eight of 2019 is res arcana thomas lyman sure knows how to do his tableau builders all right if you have any children in your home or children that like to play games there is and you want to introduce them to the magic that is the written word because a lot of times kids are now lost in screens and electronics there's a game called the crusoe crew and this will show them the magic of the printed word. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure, illustrated adventure where you're looking for pearls and diamonds. And and you can play up to four players, and every player has their own separate book. If you're the tall kid, you can see over fences. If you're the kid that can talk to animals, then the animals in the illustrated pictures will have little numbers on them. So you can flip to your own page and have a little conversation with the animal who will give you clues. It is a fantastic way to introduce children to games, to reading, and it was just an overall enjoyable experience. And that is the Crusoe Crew. My number seven is Hellboy the Board Game. Hellboy the Board Game came out of nowhere. I was not expecting to like it very much, but it really does do an excellent, excellent job of distilling all the great elements of your modern dungeon crawl, stripping away the extraneous cruft. It's got loads of content as well as a make your own scenario system and the scenarios are genuinely interesting it's kind of like a 
a mystery setup or in the first half of the investigation, you don't know why you're collecting clues. And in the second half, suddenly the clues come to light and you know why you collected them in the first place. Lots of variety, lots of visual appeal, very engaging in the co-op dungeon crawl space, which has become kind of stale in the past few years, but Hellboy brings something new to the table. And I've had a blast every time playing it. Hellboy is my number seven of 2019. Yeah, it's, it's, as soon as you said Hellboy, I like looked through my list. I said, "Why isn't it?" I think it, it just got bumped off as number eleven for all the reasons you said. Fantastic all the way around. Even though, like we've said, we've been becoming so tired of these, you know, uh, dungeon crawling co op games. Absolutely, this, this really did bring a welcoming light to that genre. My next game is Era Medieval Age by Matt Leacock. Now. This is roll roll and write was the 2019 sort of thing. This is like a sort of a spin on that where you're not actually writing, but you're you know plugging in these buildings into your little tableau and you you can clear it and redo it again type thing. So it's it's rolling dice, it's it's manipulating your little tableau to get more dice and trying to get lots of points. And I think it's just a visually stunning, appealing game. And like we said, we love tile builders because you're building this little community. This gives you gives you that same feel. You're building this little community. You're walling it off, keeping it safe. You have your little church district over here, and and you put your houses beside you know because you don't want your people to walk far to get to church, Mark. <laughs> They're not going to go if they have to walk far. And you know you have your castle there and any and all that stuff anyway and i and there's and there's a way to uh you know hit people with i guess corruption or whatever and they have to like block pieces you know parts of their board off and it's semi cutthroat so it's got a little bit of vindictiveness in it and i think it's got all the little bits and pieces that make it a great game era medieval age probably would have been around 11 or 12 on my list definitely an excellent excellent design my number six is Wavelength. Wavelength is the party game of the year, as far as I'm concerned. It's got a marvelous physical design of a beautiful little disc. You've got to see it in action. And the goal of the game was to make you feel psychic and to induce moments of high fives and cheering all around. And that is absolutely something that has been reproduced every single time we play. Whenever I conceptualize Wavelength and I remember how it works, I always wonder how on earth can you get someone to sit on a precise level of a spectrum without using precise details such as numbers or giving more detailed direction other than a single word clue. And yet you get these moments of magical mind melding where everyone is on exactly the same page despite the fact that the clues have to be almost abstract in the context of a spectrum. It is a marvelous game that does exactly what it sets out to do and is an absolute blast. And it is definitely in the, it has entered in the solid rotation of, Hey, we've got eight people sitting around and we want to have 20 awesome minutes. What are we going to do? Wavelength is available on pre-order now for both Canadians and Americans. We got a review copy early because we are extremely lucky, but my number six na- game of 2019 is Wavelength. My next game to talk about is Rook, Don Kiev. And it is on the list because it its two main elements are both very enjoyable to do. It has this fantastic sort of worker placement or action selection where you're bumping people up and down the scale, which makes, you know, your actions better or worse. And you're, you know, putting money on top of it to try to make sure that you hold those positions. And not only that, there's a, a area control part of the game that's, super cutthroat you're trying to push people out of certain areas so you can hoard those resources and make sure they don't get them and i thought all around it was a great package and not only that the components were fantastic as well my number five is the first of three two-player only games so of course sadly i don't get to play them as often as i'd like number five is undaunted normandy the world war ii deck builder that manages to Mostly not be very thematic, but at the same time be extremely compelling. The way that it deals with tactical maneuvering on an abstracted, effectively hex grid, in conjunction with deck building, where your deck is the way you issue orders to those units on the board, it's the way you buttress units units on the board... The scenarios past the first one become increasingly asymmetric and are therefore more interesting in terms of different forces being deployed and different objectives and different historical window dressing to what's going on. But fundamentally, what appeals to me about Undaunted Normandy is not so much how it models World War II warfare, but more in the way that it gives new life to deck building and the way that it interacts with tactical maneuvering there. I'm very much looking forward in 2020 to the next installment, Undaunted North Africa, which is going to promise yet more 
more armies to be introduced and other elements. I hope it does a slightly better job, for me at least, of evoking the World War II feel. But I've had a great time with Undaunted Normandy in almost all of the scenarios I've tried. The first one's a little bit dull, but at least it gets you a sense of the excellent and solid deck-building elements. And that is number five, Undaunted Normandy. I'm going to talk about a game called Ghost Stories. Whenever I played Ghost Stories, I always left, you know, hateful, regretted, and and just all around low and, and not had a good, good time, but still really loved the game. In comes a game called Last Bastion Merc that solves all of those problems. Not only does it feel as though you have a little bit more of a chance, but it holds all those key elements that, that Ghost Stories Ghost Stories, you know, has, right? All the, you know, hold the corners, you know, hard movement to move around, special abilities, all of that stuff with a theme that is sort of overdone, but still puts like a, an interesting twist on all of the, of that genre anyway. So it's a cooperative sort of defend the castle, monsters streaming in, great special abilities, great components. That's Last Bastion. My number four is Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare, which is kind of sort of almost cheating. Just a little bit of background. I don't tend to include straight reprints in my lists. So, for example, uh, Catan, Catan Starfarers I did not consider eligible. I effectively regarded it as a 1999 design. Last Bastion, was I didn't have to worry about whether or not it was enough of a redesign because, again, it was probably around you know 12 or 13, just shy of my top 10. But Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare is another Commands and Colors game. It is different from the other Commands and Colors game in the traditional ways that different Commands and Colors games are different, namely slightly different approaches to units. Different units can battle back and, and follow up under different conditions and so forth and the way the dice work, etc. If you've played one Commands and Colors game, you know very much what to expect from the system. But I have tremendous enthusiasm for Commands and Colors games, and Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare is the sci-fi version, and I do like me some sci-fi, even when it is painfully generic, as it is the case for Space Fleet Warfare. So it's kind of cheating, because pretty much any Commands and Colors game, if it is released, will if I try it, will probably find its way onto my list, but I do really enjoy uh, putting out a whole bunch of spaceships and going pew-pew. The components are a little bit ridiculous in that the board for Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare is a massive, massive, massive cloth mat that will probably be larger than many people's gaming tables, but I think it adds very much to the visual appeal, and I've had a great time with Red Alert Space Fleet Warfare even admitting that it is probably kind of sort of almost cheating. So that is number four for 2019. So you burned through your list too fast. You, no. you didn't Mark, what's your number three? What's going on? <laughs> Did you? We're skipping mine so we can get, because I only have one left. <laughs> it's, it's called, it's. Okay, wait. So when I told you that you should. <laughs> So when you decided to, first of all, you did two in a row. And secondly, you only got eight games on your list. No, no, I got ten. What's it's because on? I went first, I know. and I skipped one. Ah, oh, jeez. I counted them before we started. My number three game of 2019 is Claustrophobia 1643, and again, this is this is almost sort of kind of cheating. It's a sort of a judgment call about whether something's been redeveloped enough to consider it a full-fledged release of the year, and I do think that what they've done with Claustrophobia 1643 is really impressive development work. They've brought in the best elements from some of the two expansions to Claustrophobia. They've really tightened up some of the scenarios. They've flattened out the unfortunate siege curve that kind of existed in the original Claustrophobia. It's not a pure win in terms of upgrades because we lose the adorable troglodytes and we lose some of the pre-painting and the, the troglodytes were so cute. I loved the troglodytes from the first edition. But anyway, Claustrophobia is and always has been a wonderful game and the new edition is marvelous. And I sincerely recommend it. As far as two-player games go, I think it is still one of the absolute best. Claustrophobia 1643 was a triumph and I am looking forward to playing out more of the scenarios in the coming years. And that's my number three game of 2019. Mark, you and I played a great game called Flotilla, even though I feel as though they dropped the ball a little bit on in putting more, injecting more theme into the game. It's a fantastic post-apocalyptic water world, bringing stuff up from the bottom of the ocean to try to, you know, join on to this, you know, giant city, has great uh, card action selection where you're sort of, sort of deck building, sort of action selecting building, you're purchasing new cards to improve your deck. I think it's an all-around, very interesting, lots of decision space type game. Lots of ways to get victory points and lots of ways to create an engine. My number two game of 2019 is Barrage, something that 
Walker still wants to give a try to. Barrage is a relatively dense Euro game, but like many of the dense Euro games that I really appreciate, the f- scoring is relatively focused. It's mostly about generating power. It's not some sort of sprawling, ridiculous morass of different scoring conditions and, and weird elements. And that tight focus pays significant dividends in terms of the quality of decision-making and, of course, the quality of the player interaction, because there is fierce competition for every for everything. The economy is tight. There is high demand for everything, and you never feel like you're able to get done what you need to get done. And that is often what I'm looking for in the context of an economic management Euro game, and Barrage delivers in spades. There's been some considerable spielkiss over the quality and nature of the components, and without getting too much into that, I have the retail version, and let me tell you that it is fine. It's still an expensive product, but at least it's functional, and I have a great time generating hydroelectric power with Barrage. I think it is probably the second best pure Euro of 2019. I'm going to put on Pandemic Rapid Response, because it did make my short list. If you're looking for a game like Fuse, sort of like a fast action type, keep everyone involved type game, Pandemic Rapid Response is the one to play. You're rolling dice, you're trying to create as many resources or complete as many actions quickly as you can. The moment you feel as though you're wasting time or you just didn't quite get what you want, you say, I'm done. And the next person, you know, rolls their dice and tries to do, you know, as much as they can do. I thought they did a fantastic job. So let me tell you a story about compromise and sadness. So in the past two years that we've done this, and we've uh, we've had our personal top tens of the year and our game of the year, in the past two years we've done this, there has been complete unanimity about what the game of the year was. In 2017, it was Gloomhaven. wasn't even close. For 2018, it was pretty solidly Root. There, there was no serious dispute between the two of us as to what the t- game of the year was. This year, there was some disagreement. And I'm very disappointed... Generally speaking, it's the nature of compromise. You know, I want a podcast full of insight and erudition. Walker, on the other hand, wants incoherent grunts and mumblings. So we kind of (laughs) split the difference and we give to you what we give to you every week. But in this context, I just want to flag that if I had my druthers and I made a serious pitch for this, my personal game of the year is King's Dilemma. I think it is absolutely heads and shoulders above everything else of 2019 and indeed heads and shoulders of anything else in the legacy space, including Gloomhaven. I think Gloomhaven is a better game, but I think that what King's Dilemma does with legacy finally redeems the format. You know those interesting discussions you have where you're trying to decide what scenario to do next in a legacy game or what the overall direction of the next game could be? And some people are talking about it in terms of game mechanics and some people are talking about it in terms of headcanon and some people are talking about it in terms of the narrative that the game has supplied. That's the entirety of King's Dilemma. That is what you do every turn in King's Dilemma, not at the end of every session. And it internalizes those pressures, and it recognizes that you can approach the game on these different levels. And there's a virtue to that, so every session remains compelling, even when your priorities in session one might be radically different in kind from the priorities you're operating on in session two, because it gives you those additional levers to pull and those additional hooks to get into you. It is a marvelous this game with tremendous immersion and engagement and the mechanical elements are simple but just robust enough to get you involved and it is about negotiation not even just in terms of negotiating over resources but negotiating over the kind of ruler you want to be and of the kind of kingdom you want to have as somebody who loves negotiation games as somebody who has a political science background as somebody who loves this kind of intrigue type discussion king's dilemma completely shocked the crap out of me And it is by far my favorite release of 2019. Marvelous, marvelous game. It is not getting nearly the recognition that it deserves. And if any of this sounds remotely interesting, please do yourself a favor and try to experience the majesty that is The King's Dilemma. I agree with everything you said, especially the last part where you talked about because it's a negotiation game and I... I feel as though, like, you know how I, I dislike negotiation, negotiation games, but you saw how much I loved this game. I, it, I did get engaged. I did love it. I loved every part of it, but I feel as though some people might not enjoy it for that reason. I think it's too focused in the negotiation part, and I feel as though it's not welcoming to as many people, so therefore I, I just couldn't use it as, as the number one game of the year, Mark. Fine, fine. But it's on your list? It was it was number 11 for sure. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, with all that having been said, Walker, why don't you tell us about So Very Wrong About Games, Game of the Year 2019. 
The game of the year is Kalis 1303. Now, there was a game called Just Normal Kalis. came out many, many years ago, and it's been on people's lists for all of this time. And then they came up with an updated version. They just made it more modern. They trimmed back all of the – everything that was holding it back as being – uh, deemed an older type style game and they t- took a game that was already fantastic already held in high regard and just brought it up to date and made it that much more fun with one exception and we talked about this in our review that exception being turn order every change to KLS 1303 is vastly for the better makes the game tighter more compelling increases player interaction imp- increases the quality of the trade-offs you need to do I liked Kalis but I thought it had some rough edges and it outstayed its welcome Kalis 1303 I think is an absolute triumph make no mistake if I had my druthers King's Dilemma would be game of the year but I have absolutely no misgivings about Kalis 1303 as being game of the year because it is in in a year full of re-releases and reprints and redevelopments and tweaking this and changing that. I think that Kalis 1303 absolutely stands head and shoulders above all of them in terms of the quality of the refinements they've made, even as compared to other games like Claustrophobia 1643, games like Last Bastion, games like all these other redevelopments that we've been seeing. I think that Kalis 1303 is the masterwork of how to do it. It's as compelling as it ever was and even more so with all these changes. And it definitely takes that that cutthroat back to where it should be, where you're really punishing the other players. Not only are you taking away their special abilities, you're blocking their spaces, you're converting their buildings that they need to, you know, residential buildings, they're no longer useful. In almost every way, you're punishing your opponents, and that's why I really enjoy Kalis 1303. So very wrong up at games, Game of the Year 2019, Kalis 1303. Go listen to our review if you're at all curious. We did a full review of it not too long ago. Marvelous game. So, Walker. Yes, Mark. Next up, why don't we talk about slightly more depressing, the worst games of the year. Worst games of the year. When I was at Shucks, Mark, I played a game oh, called no. Cowboy Bebop Board Game Boogie. <laughs> and I was looking forward to Cowboy Bebop Board Game Boogie because I watched that anime in my youth many, many times. In was, your youth? <laughs> in my youth. How old are you? <laughs> it's a very old anime, Mark. <laughs> Anyway, it's, it's a great anime. I was hoping that they, you know, bring it to life in this board game, but it just seemed very punishing, handcuffing, and painful. It was more, it was, I don't, it was, it was much like uh, Cross, is it Crossfire? What's Yeah, the, Shadowrun Crossfire. Shadowrun Crossfire, where you're collecting all these cards, you need certain symbols to complete missions, and in Cowboy Bebop, you're like, zipping across the universe and this you're like trudging through the universe it's like oh i need to get here and that's my whole <laughs> turn i got halfway to where i wanted to be so that part was painful so overall terrible game it's a shame i've been re-watching cowboy build up man that show holds up it really does so good so good anyway my third worst game of the year is tapestry from the insulting themelessness of it to the relatively pointless blandness of racing up any one of four roughly interchangeable tracks for most of the time, to the buildings that don't do anything, to the marvelous pieces that serve as nothing other than paperweights. Tapestry was a disappointment on so many levels, and those are many hours of my life that I'm never getting back. Tapestry, I think, was an utter disappointment. One of the three worst games of the year, Tapestry. We just talked about Marvel Champions, the card game, already earlier you play a card, it does what it does. <laughs> it's painful that a company as big as Fantasy Flight brings out a game that really brings nothing to the industry. I wish they'd done more with it, made it a little more interesting. I'm sorry, I just don't see any redeeming qualities in this game whatsoever. My second worst game of the year is Warfighter Private Military Contractor. I love Warfighter so much. I love it for its variety. I love it for the different types of soldiers and tactics and weapons and skills that you can deploy. But for some reason, when they made Warfighter PMC, they said, let's double the paperwork and cut your options in about a fi- uh, to about a fifth. I just don't see why anyone would prefer the PMC version to normal Warfighter. It was taking the system in exactly the wrong direction. It was one of my most crushing disappointments of the year, and I also felt that it was entirely unfun and mechanical to play. Second worst game of the year, Warfighter PMC. Speaking about unfun and over-mechanical, welcome to Star Wars Outer Rim. It was high high hopes. It seemed very interesting. The components were very interesting. Some of the cards, how they interacted, and the fluff on the cards seemed 
seemed compelling and like it might go somewhere, but it never really did. It was mostly just, you know, milling around the board, trying to, you know, push the most points out of the game and just overall was an unfun experience. I joked on Twitter that my first pass, just compiling a list of all the games of 2019, that my first pass of worst three was longer than my first pass of the top 10, which is, which is a bad sign. Uh, and I assure you, Star Wars Outer Rim was in the first pass, but qu- quite frankly, could not compete with the titans of the, of this year, namely Tapestry, Warfighter PMC, and what I think was the worst design of the year, Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea. Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea looks at a game that is as, as brilliant and as refined as Civilization and said, why don't we remove all the player interaction on the front end and then on the back end reintroduce the player interaction with pointless take-that cards. And oh, by the way, let's not reduce the length or increase the quality of decision-making or indeed allow for the same kinds of decision-making at all. And oh, and let's make population control not a thing at all because we can't be bothered. It really is painful to play Ancient Civilization of the Inner Sea, not just for the length, but also to see how at every step they didn't know what they were doing because of its similarity to other better games among them civilization but by no means alone in civilization i had high hopes for the game but i genuinely thought that it was pro- that it was the worst design that i played this year and those are the worst games that we played this year under the better news, let's clear off the bile. See, people accuse us of being overly negative, but if you actually look over certainly the games we review and the games we talk about, I mean, to be frank, the overwhelming majority of games we talk about, we do so positively. It's just by comparison to people who only say good things about everything, we do sound awfully negative, but quite frankly, we talk about things we love all the time. It's true. Anyway. I, I, can, I, I can only agree with you more. What would you like to talk about next, Walker? Let's do the expansions, because that's what I have next on my list. Let's, let's... Top three expansions of this year. I'm going to start with Teotihuacan, the late pre-erastic period. Pre-classic. Pre-classic period. It's, it's, I'm just, I just picked it only because the name is so fantastic, except it's, it's <laughs> so worst, memorable, so it's, evocative. It's, it's the worst name ever. But anyway, what this, what this does introduce is it changes up the board even more. It gives you, uh, individual powers to start the game. It, just makes the all the game all around. It gives you more pieces, more interesting little little priests to put on the board. It's just an all around. It gives you this great uh, mechanism to give you each round uh, a whole new special uh, ability that you'll never remember to actually do. I think it's been like three games now that I've tried to introduce this particular module, but we've forgotten it and realized it's sitting there at turn two and said this is what we would have done if we had remembered it on top of all these other new rules. Yes. So that's Two to Walk In, late pre classic period by Boards and Dice. <laughs> you're really you're really making it sound Did great. I just sell it? Did yeah, I sell yeah, it? Yeah, you definitely sold it. My number three it. three best expansion of the year is Bad News Bears for Baron Park. Baron Park you stole it, you bad. Well, no, look, we can share. <laughs> the fact that there's been precious little crossover thus far doesn't mean we can't have crossover. <laughs> I really like Baron Park for a light game that's very, very effervescent. It's so enjoyable. And Bad News Bears offers this great visual appeal in the form of the monorails. That alone, I think, is is an excellent version of the expansion. It doesn't overload the rule set. It doesn't in any way bring... Baron Park, away from what it is, which would say a very accessible, I would say, gateway game. Would I explain Bad News Bears right away to somebody who's new to gaming? No, but it is absolutely something that you can introduce right away to people who are more experienced with tile-laying games. It's beautiful. It's delightful. It it continues to play on Baron Park's strengths. I really liked Bad News Bears as an expansion. Bad News Bears is also on my list. So my final favorite expansion... All right, so there's a game called Lords of Hellas, and it came out last in 2018. But in 2019, they brought out all the expansions. And more Lords of Hellas is great Lords of Hellas. It brings out more gods with different powers, different statues, more monsters, the ability to play six player, which I probably would never do. But that being said, it just gives you another color to choose from, which is purple, Mark. It's my favorite color. So it's it's a good thing. Purple and brown. Purple and brown. So Lords of Hellas expansions, more statues, more monsters, more greatness. Love it. 
My second favorite expansion of 2019 is also Lords of Hellas, the Dark Ages expansions. Just the new gods alone, being able to cycle through and change those all-important blessing cards really does introduce a tremendous amount of variety with no additional rules overhead. And even when you introduce a fourth god, because you can play the gods in one of two ways, the simple way or the more complicated way, the additional rules overhead, honestly, I was worried because Lords of Hellas is already full of a lot of details and things to keep track of. But the additional fourth god is very manageable. Now, the fifth and sixth players, I agree with you. It's a little bit dodgy, introduces things that are a little bit harder to track. But as an overall package of Kickstarter extras, I think that Lords of Hellas is is, is very, very good. And as a way to do bloat, it's a pretty good way to do bloat. My favorite expansion of the year is also an excellent way to do bloat, and that is Street Masters Aftershock. Tons more characters, tons more stages, interesting stage developments. Street Masters has always gotten by on the razor's edge of slightly more complicated than it wants to be, and it continues to be on the right side of that balance for all the Street Masters content that I've tried thus far. Some of the maps are, are now genuinely interesting before, and this was fine. The maps are just a grid of hexes that you can fight on, but now they have multi-level stages where you have to run upstairs to get to the balcony and things of that nature. Uh, there are streets that you can run across and get hit by cars. You know, standard fighting game stuff. Or at least relatively standard side-scrolling beat-em-up stuff, which is what Street Masters always is. I had high hopes for the expansion content, and I have been having an utter blast with all of the new stuff from Street Masters. The new characters are great. The new bosses are great. It is a wonderful set of content from Blacklist Games. I'm a huge fan of Street Masters Aftershock, and if it had been... See, this is one of those things where arbitrary distinctions matter. Had it been a standalone expansion, it easily would have been on my top 10 of 2019 in terms of top 10 games, but it was not a standalone expansion, and thus can only be relegated to the expansion content. Oh, very sad. It, well, I don't know about that, but it is what it is. <laughs> and those were our favorite expansions of 2019. Now on to the games which we thought had the best components. Because I've got something on here that didn't quite complement the game, but were very good components. I'll just start with it, and that's Tapestry. I thought the buildings were very interesting. The, the All the little tiny buildings that you put on your... Uh, on your tableau were great. The fact that the tableaus had this like sandpapery texture to them. So it held the buildings in place. So they weren't sliding all over the place. I thought overall the components of tapestry were fantastic. That's fair. Third best components of the year for me is core space. Talked about this last week, core space being an actually successful miniatures game in a box comes with a neoprene mat, a whole bunch of cardstock terrain that looks really, really good on the table furniture and, lockers and signs and all manner of crates that you actually literally fill with equipment. Open up the crates, see what's inside, plus a whole bunch of relatively well-sculpted plastic miniatures. Core Space is really how to introduce a miniatures game in a box, and especially when compared to other games we played this year, like Warcry, that didn't really do a very good job of it, or even games like God Tier that didn't really do a good job of it. It is a fantastically accessible tabletop miniatures game in a box, and the components are very high quality and very visually impressive even if you do pay a cost in terms of setup time. So my number three best components of the year is core space. My second one, I've already talked about Men at Work, is Men at Work. It's just one of those games that when someone walks by, they will stand and watch no matter what they're doing because it has these little mini meeples with little yellow hard hats on and their little blue suspenders and they're being precariously placed on these girders that are shooting in every direction. And uh, it's a very colorful, stunning game to see. I love it. Men at work. Second best component of the year for me is Wavelength. And this is actually an instance of not just the pure quality of the components, but how well the components influence the gameplay. Wavelength could not work without its beautiful molded plastic dial thingy. It is entirely a function of how it presents the information that it makes the game possible. But in terms of the way that it's been executed and manufactured, it still does a very, very good job. It's got a very tactile presence. But the best thing about it, I think, is that it allows for dramatic reveals. You get to slide away the dial with a big flick, and suddenly you get to reveal how close people were in terms of their guess. It leads to great, great drama, and it is definitely... Uh, aided by the excellent information presentation in the components, second best components of the year, Wavelength. My number one would be Era Medieval Age. Now, there are components that don't need to be super crazy awesome, but in this game, they just went over the top and made it so, like, you could, this could have been done with little tiles or little cardboard chits or or the actual, you know, draw on the piece of paper. But instead, they have these three-dimensional, huge, blocky buildings that you plug into these gigantic plastic punch boards. And, and there's, you know 
dozens and dozens of these buildings, all different colors, very highly detailed, and it just makes your board come to life. Great job, Era Medieval Age. Couldn't agree more. That is also my top game of the year for components, Era Medieval Age. I agree with everything you said. Now on to one that we put in. It's called Best Games You Didn't Like. I love this category. I love this category and the next category so much. The way that the category has been interpreted in the past, the past two times we've done it, is a game that you think has solid design credentials and has been well made, but didn't do anything for you. So you recognize it as quality, but you can't, you, but you never really enjoyed it. And for me, the best game of the year that I did not like is Black Angel. Black Angel is very, very well designed. I can't even really disagree with any of the things you said when you talked about how it was on your top 10 list, but it failed to grab me. It, I found it mechanical and unengaging. It didn't pay off the theme, either in terms of visual presentation or in terms of actually what you were doing. Although I respected its approach to engine exploitation as being very, very, very quick, ad hoc, and one-off, I did not enjoy it, and I felt that it was just a little overbaked in terms of too much detail for too little payoff. Black Angel failed to grab me, even though I respect it as a design. Oh, this, this will work the same thing. Tapestry. Great mechanical, great tracks, but as you said, it doesn't really matter what tracks you go up. It's just tracks on tracks. They all give you the same sort of thing at the end. They gave you these fantastic buildings, and all you're doing is putting them arbitrarily on this on this grid to try to fill spaces. It it gave you no visually, oh, I cool, I made a community because it doesn't really matter. It's just they I, they fit into that block, but it doesn't actually really fit because the buildings don't actually fit into the grid very well. So you're not quite sure if it's in those blocks or not. So I'm afraid. Even though some plays of Tapestry were interesting, it just overall did not do it for me. I think you're giving it far too much credit. So the worst game I did like, this is a game that I thought was not particularly well designed, but nonetheless I find enjoyable, is actually Men at Work. And here's why. One of the ways in which dexterity games often fail is in their victory conditions. They tend to be arbitrary, or they don't allow you to catch up to the leader. For example, probably one of my favorite dexterity games, probably my second favorite dexterity game, is Junk Art. But after the first or second round, sometimes it's clear who's going to win. They're, the way the scoring works doesn't allow for enough points to be scored for someone to, to reach up. So you can't really approach it as a competitive experience, which is fine. Not every game needs to be a well-balanced competitive experience. Balance not being a, an intended pun. And the men at work is definitely in that category. Whether or not you're able to score on a given round can literally be dictated by what random card you pull up for your task. Some cards, just by virtue of the way the buildings happen to be set up, will not allow you to score flat. Whereas sometimes someone will pull up a card and you'll just have a point handed to you more or less because it calls you to do something trivial, which will allow you to score. And that's again, why my favorite dexterity game of all time is Loop and Louie, because it's a legitimately good competitive experience on top of being an amazing dexterity game. But and the less said about that, the better. So despite the, uh, despite that men and work is a joy to play. It's got lovely chunky components and you're right. It always grabs an audience and it's always fun to play. I just have to take a step back and not care about who wins or why. And that's why why I think it's the worst game that I did like. Mine would be Quacks of Quillenburg, Mark. Even though I, I I bash it all the time, this this you know reaching to the bag and trying to go around the the thing just has this weird feel to it that's you know somewhat enjoyable. Even though I you know I pound on it as much as I can, I really feel as though the rules the rule set is is not that good because it's more like a deck builder but you only have four different things that you can put in your deck unlike the other games that you can put many more in it's just still that press your luck feel that makes it a little bit fun and that's quacks of quillenberg fair enough on to the next category the biggest disappointments of 2019 these are things you wanted to like or thought would be good but somehow the game lets you down I have three listed here. The first one is Thunderstone Quest Barricades Mode. I really like cooperative deck builders. There are a number of them on the market, and they're often relatively easy to do. And indeed, there was a popular fan version of, th of cooperative Thunderstone Advance back in the day. And then there was an official co-op version of Thunderstone Advance, and it worked pretty well. So I was looking forward to the latest version of Thunderstone, Thunderstone Quest, having a pretty good cooperative version. But Barricades Mode didn't do anything for me. It removes one of the central tensions of the game, whether to go to the village or go to the dungeon. Now everyone's doing both. And it failed to pay off on some of its more interesting ideas. And I felt that it really was disappointing as far as co-op deck builders go. And so one of my biggest disappointments of the year was Thunderstone Quest Barricades mode. 
my third one for biggest disappointment, I'm not going to go on about it again, but just a different point. It was Tapestry. They first announced it as a civilization game, and when it was evident that it was not, it was a little bit of a disappointment. Just like a side note, we were just at uh, some uh, like an all-day gaming event, and someone had said, oh, we're looking for a civilization game, and the, and the store owner says, oh, this one's much better than Sid Meier's civilization game. Here's Tapestry, and, you know, I just have to sit there and bite my tongue and, and, and just let them go on. And they also talked, he said, and his Stone Meyer games can do no, pro, no wrong. He said, they also put out Wingspan this year, and then one of the, one of the customers said, oh, yes, I love Wingspan. It, it's got great mechanisms. And the bird theme, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's birds. You can insert any theme and it would still work. And I sort of went, isn't that the point? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we, we, we both had to hold our tongue a number of times. This being said, day, it would be Tapestry as my number three. Disappointment. My number two, I've already alluded to this. I talked about how prior to playing this game, I had always enjoyed the MOBA-style board games that I'd played. This is Cloudspire. Coming off the success of Too Many Bones, I was perhaps unreasonably hopeful about Chip Theory Games' next release, Cloudspire, given that their first release, Haplomachus, didn't really do much for me either. So, generally speaking, perhaps we should be regarding Too Many Bones as the aberration rather than the other way around. Uh, Cloudspire didn't really do much for us. We talked about this at length in the review. It felt that it was an overproduced, relatively tedious experience, more mechanical than engaging but I was really looking forward to it, again, because I like tower defense, I like MOBA style games, I like being able to throw minions against other kinds of minions, I just think that Cloudspire hit all the wrong notes, and so Cloudspire was my second biggest disappointment of 2019. My number two is Edge of Darkness. I really love Mystic Veil, vale. I was really looking forward to yet another, you know, slide in the transparent card and create your own little deck. It even had this giant castle cube droppy thing. And when it ended up not all working together and not giving me a, a, an enjoyable experience like Mystic Veil vale did, I was very disappointed. So Edge of Darkness would be my number two. Edge of Darkness was narrowly edged out on my list of worst of the year, but it was a contender. My biggest disappointment of 2019, not even in so far as it was one of the worst games of the year, was Brook City. Again, Blacklist Games, their first release was Street Masters, and I love Street Masters so much, I was looking forward to seeing what they were doing with the system. Brook City was their second release. It was the cop show-themed version. But I really, again, felt that it didn't hit the right notes. It brought the system to a place it didn't want to go. It became an unmanageable mess of card effects that were very, very difficult and tedious to apply. It was more about getting from point A to point B than exploiting cool card combos and doing awesome stuff. I wanted to like Brook City. I even enjoyed some of my moments with Brook City. But at the end of the day, overall, I felt it really didn't work. And so it was my biggest disappointment of 2019, Brook City. My di biggest disappointment, you've already said it, is Cloudspire. Love tower defense games. Love setting up different ways. You know, you can make units double back or take the extra long way around so you can pound them with your, your turrets that much longer. I was sort of looking for that experience. I The components looked amazing. The whole thing as a package looked like it was going to be interesting, and it just did not come together. And so I was very disappointed on how Cloudspire panned out. You know, Walker, this has been too much sadness. It is. I think we should ban all future sadness from this episode of So Very Wrong About Games. I think we should move on to happier days. The biggest pleasant surprises. Biggest pleasant surprises, because we are jaded old curmudgeons, but sometimes we find things that can shock us to our very core with joy. I'll let you go first, Mark. Cheer me up. Sure. Uh, my third biggest surprise of the year was Among Thieves. This was sent to us by a listener, in point of fact, and Among Thieves seeks to be a large number iterated Prisoner's Dilemma game, and there are a number of games of the year of, of recent release, games like Good Critters or a similar kinds of games that rely on treachery and betrayal that either, number one, don't force you to be mean, or number two, don't really have the reward systems quite right to give the proper tension of knowing that maybe you should work together, but at the end of the day, it's in your interest to knife people at the right moment. But Among Thieves, in terms of that core gameplay loop of having the incentive structure right, gets things 
perfect. And I really enjoyed that aspect of Among Thieves. I was not expecting Prisoner's Dilemma in an iterative fashion to be done quite so well. The design as a whole doesn't hang together quite as well as its core gameplay loop because the event cards are some nonsense and some of them are borderline unfun. But in terms of that that element of knowing when to betray people and having it be properly incentivized to do so among thieves was a triumph. And so it was one of the biggest surprises of 2019. My first surprise was it's a wonderful world. This is a game I never even heard of. He sort of just pulled it out and said, Hey, we're going to play this drafting game. The way it, it flowed so smoothly and worked together and gave you such a huge decision space in such a small time. I just was blown away by it's a wonderful world. My second biggest pleasant surprise of 2019 was Era Medieval Age. I was not expecting to like Era Medieval Age nearly as much as I did. I was not expecting it to exploit the physicality of the design quite to the same extent. I wasn't expecting it to look as good as it did on the table. But underestimating Matt Leacock is not a good idea. He knows what he's doing. And even in a genre that I don't really like, namely the sort of broadly speaking, roll and write. I figured out, oh, well, it's a roll and build, but how different could it be? The answer is substantially. And I wasn't, I hadn't been a huge fan of Roll Through the Ages, of which also era medieval age was inspired. But really, everything was tightened up and made more compelling and more visually appealing and more engaging. And so I, had a, I was completely unprepared by how much I enjoyed era medieval age. That was my second biggest surprise of the year. Second one was The King's Dilemma. As you know, I hate negotiation, not hate, I dislike most negotiation games. This blew me away, especially the fact that it's legacy, the fact that, like you said, every round you're molding this story and you're creating these interesting, you know, storylines and you're talking back and forth and you're, and you're making this whole world come to life. I really enjoy The King's Dilemma. My biggest pleasant surprise of the year was Cthulhu Death May Die. I was so unprepared to like this at all. At all, at all. It was by designers, I think, who'd best, whose best works are behind them. It was a theme that I'm completely unengaged by, and it's a, by a studio that, quite frankly, although I adore many of their designs, they're very hit or miss, and a lot of the things aren't designed for me. But Cthulhu Death May Die, very much like Hellboy, but in a different way, completely shocked me with how much it invigorated the sort of co-op crawling around doing stuff on a map with miniatures kind of genre. It is modular in the very best kinds of ways. It has an appropriately irreverent take on its own theme. It seems to know that its own theme is bad and stupid, and so plays with that to a certain extent. And it's just an, a quick, compelling, in-your-face game about hard cases going and doing something stupid. So I was expecting to hate it, and in fact, I enjoyed it a great deal. My biggest pleasant surprise was Cthulhu Death May Die. My biggest surprise was a party game. Mark, with some party games, when you read the rules, they're either going to play out exactly like they sound, and there's going to be no hidden nuances. It's just going to be, okay, this is, you know, a silly game. You're going to be silly. Or it's going to be like Cockroach Poker, where it's like, hold up. There's something going on here. I feel Wavelength was that. I read the rules for Wavelength, or when it's explained to me, it's like, oh, you're just, you know, trying to get people to move the dial. But just the the cleverness of the clues and and the root and the questions you can come up with I just think and the the minimal time that it takes I think they did a really fantastic job and the greatest surprise this year was wavelength Onward to more positivity, the most anticipated of 2020. These are the games coming up in the year that we are looking forward to. And I, for my part, I would just like to stress that these are the games that are going to be released this year, not the Kickstarters that are being released this year. Walker can do whatever he likes, but these are not the campaigns or the revenue generating parts. Oh, you mean like Kickstarters games. that are coming up? No, no, no. These no, are, no. These are actual kick- games that like, are probably or, going to be released or in Kickstarters 2020. Kickstarters that might fulfill, hopefully fulfill. No, 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 no. I'm not... <laughs> but what if they're already completed? Oh, already completed? Yes, yes, already yes, completed. Yes, yes, sure. Right. In the same way that retail releases can be yes. delayed further, yes. Uh, so one of my most anticipated for 2020 is the latest output of Jim Felly, one of my absolutely favorite board game designers. It is Cosmic Frogs. Cosmic Frogs is a ridiculous theme implemented with ridiculously gorgeous artwork. No, you have to give the whole title, Mark, because the whole title is amazing. <laughs> I actually can't remember the whole time. Neither can I. I looked at it today and I said, I gotta write this whole thing down because it's amazing. Oh, no. Every, everything about Cosmic Frogs is absolutely amazing. Yes, the full title is Cosmic Frog World Eaters from Dimension Zero. 
And I got to say, if you want brightly colored 1950s slash 60s era psychedelia representation of divine, immortal, two mile, to- two mile high frogs, this is the game you've been waiting for. I've seen early drafts of the components. They are absolutely trippy and amazing. The gameplay looks solid and engaging. I am always keen to see what Jim Felly puts out, and this looks to be an absolutely, well, it's certainly a unique game, if nothing else. I'm looking forward to trying it in 2020. What I'm looking forward to is a game that we've already played, Guards of Atlantis 2. We love Guards of Atlantis, and the fact that they've cleaned it up, refined it, and added even more stuff Looking forward to playing Guards of Atlantis 2. See, I fear it's not going to be released in 2020. The the Kickstarter is going to be released very soon. Yeah, as soon as as it was coming out of my mouth, I realized it's like, didn't he say this was going to be Kickstarted? Probably not going to be coming out this year. That's fine. It'll still be Kickstarted this year. But on the topic of Wolf Design, a studio and a group of designers that thus far has produced nothing but excellent designs. We've played Guards of Atlantis 2, and we can already attest that it's marvelous. Guards of Atlantis is brilliant. They've also released... Warpgate, which is an excellent sort of almost sort of not quite uh, 4X game. We've reviewed all these games, but they will be releasing this year Trickshot, which is their two-player hockey game. Also a tremendous design. We've played an early release copy. This honestly is a studio that is yet to produce anything short of excellent, which is truly a high bar. Always one to watch. They kickstarted it last year and fulfillment should be this year. Trickshot. I'm absolutely looking forward to it in 2020. So looking forward to it. You want to take a game with such minimalistic rules and components, but they've created these really cool hockey player figures, but the decision spaces and the, and the strategy, I can't wait to play more of Trickshot. Mine is a game that is just a reprint, but it was one that was very hard to get. It's called Project Elite. I only remember it because I have it written down. It's a name for some reason I can never remember, but it's been put out by Cool Mini or Not. They've redone it with all sorts of more expansions. It's going to be on the shelf soon. It's a real-time move quickly around, roll dice, move some more, shoot aliens as they slowly progress towards your base. I think they did a fantastic job. And even if they tweak the rules just slightly, I think it can only be better. Looking forward to playing more Plogic Elite. I'm looking forward to Steven Universe Beach of Palooza card battling game. I am a massive Steven Universe fan. Honestly, based on my understanding of the theme, I think that Steven Universe Beach of Palooza could be a great game because I think it's actually a good way to involve the huge cast of the series in an interesting way. There are going to be fusions and all that kind of good stuff. I am very much looking forward to the Steven Universe card game. I'm looking for a game that I already talked about, Titan. It's this giant drill into a planet, take all the resources, create cool pipelines, playing cards, this giant plastic you know, circular. It's it's going to be interesting. I I'm Anyway, let's move on. I'll be talking about it again in a moment. My final element of most anticipated of 2020 is all the indie miniatures rule systems that are going to be released in 2020. I've been having a great time with a lot of independent miniatures rule sets, among them Gaslands, which is probably my favorite of the lot thus far. But the people behind Gaslands, or at least some of them, will be releasing their sci-fi starship battling game called A Billion Suns. I'm very much looking forward to that. Roby Jenkins, the man behind Horizon Wars, is going to be releasing a 28mm solo slash co-op squad-based miniatures game called Zero Dark. That's already in beta for Patreon backers. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the deluxe versions of Rangers of Shadow Deep and additional content for that that line. I'm it, it really seems like miniatures games are blowing up in the same way that role-playing games are. Yeah, you can play the stalwarts, you can play your your Games Workshop products, and you can play your D&D, but if you want to find some indie stuff, there's tons of real quality stuff there that's very interesting and inventive, and I can't wait to see what 2020 has in store in that field. And that's what we're most looking forward to in 2020. I'm sure we'll be talking about a lot of this stuff later. Now... I guess we're going to go a little bit negative. Games that you want to be really good in 2020, but you really feel as though they're going to be a disaster. Disaster is a strong word. Why don't we just say we, we doubt that they'll be good? All right. Or, Dave, we, or we expect to be disappointed. Expect to be disappointed. District 9, the board game. Oh, yeah. I want to be this. I want this to be so good, but it's going to be so, so terrible. <laughs> District 9, the board game. So I already talked about the Steven Universe Beach of Palooza card battling game. Erica Bioris, who is my favorite designer, despite the fact that I've never played anything by her, will also be releasing this year. It is anticipated that the fulfillment will be coming for the Scott Pilgrim Miniatures The World game, which I will absolutely play and probably find crushingly disappointing. 
We've already talked about how in the two-player miniatures battling game field, it's very, very crowded. There are tons of brilliant designs. And I just have this hunch that the Scott Pilgrim game won't come up to snuff, but I don't care. I don't care. It'll be fantastic. It's going to be great. Another gigantic Kickstarter that's fulfilling in 2020 is a game called Title Blades. It's another, you you collect all these dice up and you throw them into this arena that you got in the deluxe version and you go out adventuring and and it's going to be a disaster. I, I can't wait to play it. Gale Force 9 will probably sometime this year, maybe, hopefully, will be releasing Aliens, Another Glorious Day in the Core. The original Aliens board game, way back in the day, by Leading Edge Hobbies. Which we both love. Which we both love, was fabulous and evocative and thematic and engaging, and I doubt that Aliens, Another Glorious Day in the Core will measure up in any way, shape, or form. Mine last, I already talked about Titan. I'm also going to put it in this in this category as well, just because of the scope of the Kickstarter that they have started. The fact that it's going to be this gigantic plastic disc with all these pieces that click in, and and so many you know drilling bits and cities and modules, and it's going to be. We'll see if it actually fulfills in 2020. Mark, we'll see how <laughs> that goes. Uh, finally, for me, is the latest released from Blacklist Games, namely Hour of Need. First of all, it's not necessarily clear that it's going to be fulfilled in 2020, but if it is, I cannot imagine, based on their track record now, that it's going to be nearly up to the promise of their initial promise of Street Masters, but we'll see. I want it to be good. All right, the ones that got away from me this year, Mark, the games I really wanted to play but never got to, like you already said, Barrage. It's this great, you know, water flowing from the top. You got to sort of manipulate it and only get it into your, I don't want to go to, I've never played it. So <laughs> I can't really talk about it, but it just sounds amazing. It, it's getting great praise and I can't wait to give it a try. So I'm actually pretty happy with the ones that got away on, on this list. There are only a couple that I, that I think would really appeal to us. One that I really am looking forward to trying and I think will be right up our alley is the expansion to food chain magnate, namely the ketchup mechanism and other ideas. It was released late in 2019, but we haven't had a chance to try it yet. It has some, it's modular, which is not my favorite version of expansion, but quite frankly, given the quantity of content in the expansion, that's obviously a necessity, but I'm looking forward to trying the new milestones at least, which is probably the easiest and biggest shakeup to the core game. Another game that you got to play that I did not is Zombicide Invader. Just the things they did with, you know, certain energy weapons work out in space and combustible weapons do not. You can only use those inside. And just some of the things they've changed normal Zombicide up, I wouldn't mind giving it a whirl. A release by GMT called Tank Duel, Enemy in the Crosshairs. People have been comparing it favorably to Upfront, which is an old classic favorite of mine. And we know a number of people nearby who are very much into tank combat and all the uh, little details therein. It has been getting some good early results, and I never really got a chance to track down a copy. I would very much like to try Tank Duel from GMT Games. My last one is we both love 51st State Master Set. Now the game came out this year called Imperial Settlers Empires of the North, which is done in the same genre with extra stuff and refined yet again, so I wouldn't mind giving it a whirl and seeing what it's all about. You get to conquer the world as Canada in that one, right? Oh, sweet. Yeah. Two games from uh, Awakened Realms that we didn't try that, quite frankly, I'm not broken up about that we didn't get to try, specifically Tainted Grail and Nemesis. Tainted Grail is very much in a genre that we're kind of sick of, the mostly solo, story-driven, endless campaign type thing. And Nemesis is semi-co-op, and quite frankly, everything I've, I've learned about it after release doesn't inspire me that they've solved some of the fundamental problems. And it sounds like, yet again, another three-plus-hour, not particularly polished experience that we could do without. I would try them if they were put in front of me, but we're not going to bend over backwards to try to find uh, secure ourselves an opportunity to try it. Unless, of course, you, the listeners, demand it. But quite frankly, we don't think that you're, pro you're probably not holding your breath on that either. Similarly, there is the latest Vitality. Hal Lacerda release on Mars, which we are probably going to try sometime in the coming year, but quite frankly, I'm not particularly optimistic. Now on to the most important category, Mark. Best movie of 2019. Parasite. 
The Irishman. That's going to do it for this year. And by this year, I mean last year, as of two weeks ago. Thanks very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page. Or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. And you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>